1964, Perry left Sylvania to found his own company, ESL, thus becoming an early Silicon Valley entrepreneur. In 1976, President Carter appointed Perry as undersecretary for research and engineering. During his tenure, he championed the so-called offset strategy, which I'll we'll talk about a little bit more, pioneering the use of new digital technology for systems like GPS and stealth. After leaving office, Perry returned to California, working to identify and support emerging technology companies. He also returned to academics, teaching math and engineering at Stanford. In 1993, President Clinton appointed Perry Deputy Secretary of Defense, and in 1994, Secretary of Defense. Among his accomplishments during his tenure was overseeing the dismantling of thousands of nuclear weapons in the former Soviet Union, as well as in the United States. Perry was also the most traveled Secretary of Defense, focusing on the world's most critical security hotspots, including North Korea, Iran, Russia, and China. After leaving office in 1996, Perry again returned to the Bay Area, teaching at Stanford, where he remains as an emeritus professor and serving on the boards of several new high-tech companies. In 2007, Perry joined George Shultz Henry Kissinger, and Sam Nunn to publish several groundbreaking editorials in the Wall Street Journal, calling for us to move towards a world without nuclear weapons, and describing practical steps that can be taken immediately to reduce nuclear dangers. This has been the primary focus of his life since that time. He says that these efforts are motivated <coughs> by his and Lee's five children, eight grandchildren, and one great-grandchild. Now I'd like to welcome Dr. William Perry. I would imagine I'm the oldest person in the room here. <laughs> well, in fact, I was. <laughs> the day that the nuclear bomb destroyed Hiroshima, I was 17. A few months later, I turned 18. I joined the U.S. Army and was assigned to become a part of the Army of Occupation in Japan. Nothing, nothing prepared me to the utter devastation I saw in Tokyo when I arrived there. All wooden buildings had been burned to the ground. Most of the concrete buildings were badly destroyed. The survivors were living in rubble. The damage of Tokyo, in many ways compared to the damage in Hiroshima, was with one hugely important difference. The destruction of Tokyo took two years, a fleet of bombers, tens of thousands of bombs. Hiroshima was destroyed in an instant, with one bomber and one bomb. Einstein has famously <coughs> said that with the development of the atomic bomb, everything, everything has changed except the way we think. But I must say, even that experience, early experience of mine, did begin to change my way of thinking. Indeed, this experience began my journey at the nuclear brink, which of course is the title of my book. The next milestone of my journey occurred in 1962. I was at this time working at a laboratory in uh, Mountain View, California, and was a part-time pro bono consultant for the Department of Defense and the CIA. And one day in October, I received a telephone call from the Deputy Director of CIA, asking me to come back to consult with him on an important technical problem. And I said, sure, I'll rearrange my schedule. I'll see you next Monday morning. He said, no, you don't understand. I need to see you right away. So I got on the red eye that night. Next morning, I met in his office, and I was stunned when he showed me pictures of Russian missiles being deployed in Cuba. And that was my first introduction to what came to be called the Cuban Missile Crisis. I worked as part of a small team, must have been six or seven of us, sort of around the clock, 
we start in the morning, look at all the data that's been collected that morning and the night before. And by midnight, we had a report written on what the significance of it was. So that report would be on the desk of President Kennedy first thing in the morning. So he could do his planning for the day based on what had happened in the previous day. Every day that I went into that analysis center, I believe would be my last day on Earth. Those of you who did not live through that crisis may not understand just how tense it was. But I was not only living through it, I was looking at the data that was being collected every day. And I thought it was the end of everything. I still believe, to this day, that we avoided a nuclear catastrophe as much by good luck as by good management. The third milestone occurred in 1978. At the time, I was now out of left my job in industry and was now the Under Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. And I was sleeping soundly one night and I got a call in the middle of the night from the watch officer at the North American Air Defense Command. The general, general got right to the point. He told me his computers were showing 200 missiles on the way from the Soviet Union to the <coughs> United States. And for one horrible moment, I believe we were about to experience the nuclear catastrophe that we had narrowly avoided in, <clears throat> we'd narrowly avoided in the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. And within seconds, he had assured me that this was a false alarm. He had recognized it as such. He was calling me so I could help him figure out what had gone wrong with his computers. So he had something he could explain to the president in his briefing the next morning. Uh, I should tell you that I was not able over the telephone to figure out. <laughs> so, in fact, it took us two days to determine what had happened was that the sergeant who came on watch that night took the tape out to put in the computer. Instead of putting in the operating tape, he mistakenly put in a training tape, which of course was designed to be very, very realistic. Uh, happily, the general who was on watch was able to figure out, he didn't know what had gone wrong, but he knew this wasn't the real thing. Of course, so it was human error. Nothing people had ever planned for, it was just human error. That false alarm could have ended our civilization. It truly could have. And I am personally aware of three false alarms in the United States besides that one, and I don't know how many false alarms might have occurred in the Soviet Union. I imagine their computers were no more reliable, or their operators were no more reliable than ours. The fourth milestone <coughs> occurred when I became the Secretary of Defense in 1994. By that time, the Soviet Union had dissolved, and the nuclear weapons that had been owned by the Soviet Union now devolved into the four republics where they were located. Besides Russia, it was Ukraine, Belarus, and Kazakhstan. The last three republics had no capability at all for managing the, either the technical or the strategic aspect of those missiles. And besides that, each of those three republics was in political, economic, and social chaos. This we called the loose nukes problem. And I consider it the, the gravest problem of our time. And I made my top priority as a Secretary of Defense to deal with that problem. <coughs> it's a very unusual priority for Secretary of Defense, who's usually concerned with building up weapons. But the goal we set for ourselves was to dis dismantle all of the weapons in those three republics during my first term in office. And we succeeded in doing that. But we had no <coughs> plan for doing that. This is a contingency no one had ever even envisioned. So we had to completely improvise. Uh, fortunately, we had two enlightened senators, Senator Nunn and Senator Lugar, who had put through the Senate and then eventually through the Congress a program to deal with that. It gave me the authority to deal with the problem. It was called the Nunn-Lugar Program. And that program gave the Secretary of Defense authority to negotiate with those countries and with Russia and come up with a plan for eliminating those weapons. And we did that. During the first term, of President Clinton, we dismantled all 4,000 
of those nuclear weapons in those three different republics. I might say parenthetically that we have today with us a man, uh, Gonet, who had assisted in that dismantling. He worked for Bechtel at the time. And he brought me as a souvenir a package of sunflower seeds. <laughs> Why sunflower seeds? It's because when we had finished dismantling all those weapons, we filled the silo holes back in again, and then we assisted the Ukrainian farmers with planting sunflowers. We converted missile fields into sunflower seeds. And so Bill brought me these sunflower seeds as a, as a, as a memory of that wonderful event. By the time I left office then, besides having converted, dismantled those 4,000 weapons in the U.S. in the former Soviet Union, we dismantled another 4,000 in the U.S., 8,000 in all. And all of the fissile material that was in those bombs was converted to nuclear fuel for American reactors. And those reactors now provide about half of the electricity generated in the United States today. It used to be bombs. So this is a very modern example of turning swords into plowshares. Well, at the time I left office, I thought we were well on our way to dealing with the deadly nuclear legacy of the Cold War. But that was not to be. After I left office, the dismantle market stopped, and we still had tens of thousands of nuclear bombs left. That takes me now to my fifth milestone, which occurred in 2007, when I got together with George Schultz, Henry Kissinger, and Sam Nunn, and the four of us collaborated in an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal, which warned of the dangers today, not 10 years ago, 20 years ago, the dangers today of this ter terribly deadly nuclear arsenal. And proposed a move toward the world without nuclear weapons, and in the meantime, steps that could lessen the dangers of the, of the nuclear weapons that still existed. The high point, that whole program, occurred in February of 2009, when President Obama, just one month after he was in office, stood up in Prague and made a famous speech. The most significant line in that speech is, I state clearly and with conviction the commitment of the United States to seek the peace and security of a world without nuclear weapons. For me, those were golden days. I had never imagined hearing a president say that. But alas, they could not be sustained. Today, we still have about 20,000. We, the world, still has about 20,000 nuclear weapons, enough to blow the, everybody in the planet <coughs> several times over. Those weapons pose an immediate problem of, nuclear, of the danger of nuclear terrorism, the immediate problem of the possibility of a regional nuclear war, and then to add to the, the, the grief, the antagonism between Russia and, and the United States is reaching a point now where we are, I believe, on the brink of a new nuclear arms race. It just breaks my heart. Today, the danger of a nuclear catastrophe is actually higher than it was during the Cold War. Let me say that again. Today, the danger of a nuclear catastrophe is higher, significantly higher, than it was during the Cold War. And our policies are not compatible with those dangers. So you're asking the democracy, how could that happen? It happens because the public is blissfully unaware of those dangers. So I'm dedicating my efforts, <coughs> what I, years I have left, to educating the public on the current danger of nuclear weapons. And the first effort in that is this book, which I just published, My Journey at the Nuclear Brink. I recognize, of course, that that book will hit only a small and select audience, like the group here tonight. And that audience will not include many youth. So beyond the book, I've started a program of education to reach a much larger audience you don't do that through books, you do it through the internet. So it's divided the educational materials that we set in classes we can conduct over the, over the internet. Uh, with us here tonight is the director of that project, Robin Perry. I don't see her right now, but she's there in the back there. <laughs> and the director of education, David Perry, who incidentally is a resident of Petaluma. <laughs> well, I have had a gloomy message for you tonight, and I'd like to end it on somewhat of an upbeat note. 
See, I could never be in the business I'm in now if I didn't have, if I wasn't a chronic optimist. I'm often asked how it's possible I could be so hopelessly idealistic to think that we could ever eliminate nuclear weapons. And when I'm asked that, I answer them with a quote from Andre Sokolov. Sokolov, who was living in the Soviet Union in the bad old days when it was really a really terrible place to live, worked for political reform, which meant his life was on the line every day by fighting for political reform in the Soviet Union. And he said, when asked why he would do this stupid thing, he said, there is need to create ideals, to create ideals, even when you cannot see any route to achieving them. Because if there are no ideals, then there can be no hope. That's so cool. I've also been asked why, at my obviously advanced age, I continue to work on this hopeless problem instead of settling down and spending my golden years in that Garden of Eden known as Palo Alto. <laughs> in response, I quote Robert Frost. The words are lovely dark and deep, but I have promises to keep, and miles to go before I sleep, and miles to go before I sleep. Thank you.